Hi, I'm Anders Wallander. I'm the head of the controls division at the ITO organization. Our mission is to de deliver the integrated control system to operate ITO. In this talk, I will try to explain what that means. I start to show this picture of the integrated control system. This is all what we need. Three buttons. One to start the plasma, one to stop the plasma, and the dial to select the required Q. Remember that the Q value is the efficiency factor, so the fusion power divided by the injected power. And the value over one is break even. Now we only need to connect this box with the cable to the tokamak, and we're done. As you can see, the control, integrated control system is very small and simple, so it's often forgotten. You cannot picture it like steel and concrete, and if there is a cable, people think it's okay. It's also just a small fraction of the total cost of the project, and therefore uh, there is no attention to it. So, <coughs> it's, it's actually very common in, in many projects that the control system is forgotten until the last late state of the project, and this causes long delays of the starting of operation. Remember, without a control system, everything else is useless. Think about your washing machine at home. What would you do it with it if you didn't, didn't have a start button? So do you really think it's so simple as shown here? What is inside this box? What is behind these buttons? The answer is software, software, and software. So the ETO brain is software. So in the rest of this talk, we will open this box and look what is inside. <clears throat> so let's start to go system by system what is needed to get plasma. We will uh, discuss briefly the control functions of each of the system and to see the current status. But before doing that, let's have a quick look on the ETO site or ETO platform to, <coughs> to see the geographical location of the main system. So here in the very back, we have the grid and el electrical networks, so the incoming power from the French grid. In front of that, we have the cryo plant, which is the liquid helium factory to provide the liquid helium to the superconducting coils. To the right, we have the power supplies, which provides the current to the coils. In front of that, we have the assembly hall, where the machine is assembled, and the tokamak complex, where the machine is actually installed. In front of that, there's a building dedicated to heating system, and in the foreground, we have a, a cooling water and heat reaction system with the cooling tower. Then to the right, we have the control building. First system, electricity. So everyone needs electricity. So we need to take the power from the grid and transform and distribute it on the platform. So the control system needs to ensure the right currents are flowing in the right place and take action if faults appear or configuration are changed. So this system started operation in 2019 and is continuously adding more load centers. So the pictures here we see at the bottom a high voltage transformer and high voltage cables during construction and to the right uh, some early commissioning activities. So actually commissioning is maybe the most interesting part of the project. The first time you press a button, what happens? So this is a human machine interface screenshot. Um, so th this is what you see uh, on a computer screen in the main control room, which summarizes the status of the electrical system. So again here we have the site map, so the, the power comes in to the left, the Tokama complex is in the center, and the cooling water area to the right. Then we have the distribution of the power uh, to uh, load centers, which then distribute um, further to the clients. 
So this is animated using a kind of traffic light animation. So each load center is green, yellow, or red. If it's green, everything is okay. If it's yellow, it's working in degraded mode. And if it's red, it's a real fault. So the clients are not provided with power. At this particular time when this screenshot was taken, everything was fine except need <coughs> one of the medium voltage load center which happened to be under ma uh, maintenance. Similar the cables, the lines are animation of the high voltage cables. So green mean energized and red not. We can also see here the consumed power at the different locations. Uh, finally, we can see that it's quite complete, this image. So we have still some boxes in gray around the Tokama complex, which still had to be constructed. But we can say that this system is more than 50% complete. Next, we have buildings and site services. So we need buildings to install the systems, and we need to control the environment in these buildings, like temperature, pressure, dust, and so on. And we need to provide services like fire protection, compressed air, gases, and water to the clients installed in these buildings. So the control system needs to ensure the environment is correct and service or services are provided. So again, here we have some pictures. To the left, we see some commissioning activities and uh, HVAC unit. Top right, a uh, screenshot of the uh, production system for demineralized water. And to the bottom right, some date, six month data of temperatures of the building to check the correct functioning of the environment control. Similar, we have a, a the overview a human machine interface in the control room where each building is indicated in a say, traffic light and green is OK. And we can see here that we are not as advanced with this system. So there are many more buildings still to be integrated. Next, we have the cooling water. So we need to cool equipment around the site and react the heat through cooling towers. So the control system controls valves, pumps, and regulate flows, pressures, and temperatures. And this system started commissioning in 2020, and the first clients are now being served. So the picture top right is uh, some of these um, impressive uh, cooling water pipes in the, in the area of the cooling tower. You have some pictures from commissioning activities here with people. And to the left, you have some data from the first flushing of clients. Uh, this is another example where we have the HMI for the cooling tower during the first flush of water through the cooling tower. So you see the animated symbols in circles. And uh, <coughs> so it takes water from the hot basin in the bottom, pumps it through a flow regulator up to the top of the cooling tower and then spray it over a big cooling fan. So you see the water to the picture on the top right and some data below which shows the status of the pump and fan and the flow and some temperatures in the cooling tower fan. Next we have the cryogenic cooling. So we need to produce and distribute liquid nitrogen and liquid helium to the magnets, cryo pumps, current leads and thermal shield. So the control system needs to control and monitor the production and the distribution to all clients and regulate and monitor flow rates, pressures, and temperatures. So this system started commissioning in early 2022. And you see a, a part of the liquid helium factory on the picture to the right. And again, some commissioning activities with people bottom left in the local control room. So here is another example uh, during the first test of compressed helium compressor stations. So these are big water-cooled motors, which you see animated again in the circles. And uh, you see the data is um, helium compressor motors and uh, cooling water pump, the temperature of the cooling water, and the consumed power from the electrical distribution. So here we combine data from three different systems. Next, we have the coil power supply. So the magnets need well-controlled currents to generate the required magnetic fields. So the control system needs to control and monitor the AC-DC converters to produce the right current at the right time, and, but also to control and monitor the switching networks, bus bars, protection circuits, and so on. So this is the first system which uses fast 
distributed real-time control working in the kilohertz range as opposed to slow industrial control like we talked about before which runs in the ten, ten, tens of hertz region. So coil power supply is in construction, final construction, and commissioning is expected to start at the end of this year. So the picture shows some, uh, one of these AC-DC converters installed, and the uh, uh, drawing above is an uh, 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 illustration of all the circuits in the coil power supply system. Uh, one uh, part of the coil power supply system is the reactive power compensation and harmonic filtering, which is uh, used to uh, protect the grid and optimize the AC performance. And this occupies a large area on the platform, about one hectare of big uh, electrical components, as, as you can see here. So for this system, the low voltage commissioning is almost completed and high voltage commissioning will start in the next couple of months. Then we have vacuum, so we need vacuum in the vessel obviously, but also in the cryostat neutral beam and other places. So the control system needs to control and monitor many different types of pumps, valves, re regeneration of cryo pumps, etc. So this system is in manufacturing and construction, as you can see in these pictures from factories. And you can also see the 3D model of all the vacuum components, which is around the tokamak, which is quite impressive. So one little part of this vacuum system is to uh, generate what is called cryogenic guard vacuum system. Uh, so this is picture is from a um, factory acceptance test recent, which demonstrate that the control system automates the process of pumping down a client and isolate it. Then we have the big structures, vacuum vessel, cryostat, thermal shield, and so on. Uh, here the control system cannot control anything, but we need to monitor the structures, so the temperatures, mechanical deformation, and stress, and so on. So here we have some pictures of uh, components as well as 3D models. Of course, we have the magnets, the superconducting magnets, and the conventional in-vessel coils. So here the control system needs to monitor temperature, coolant flow, mechanical integrity and feeders and detect fault, in particular quenching when we lose superconductivity and take correct, corrective actions. So the three main vacuum uh, magnet system we can see here, top right is a toroidal field coil, bottom right a poloidal field coil and to the left one central solenoid unit. So uh, we need to inject fuel in vacuum vessel to create and maintain the plasma. So the control system needs to control the injection of the right amount of fuel at the right time. And we ne it needs to control the plasma density during plasma pulse in real time uh, density feedback control. And also the control system needs to mitigate disruption by triggering the massive injection of impurity fu fuel. So here we see um, again a 3D drawing of the, of the uh, model of the distribution of the gas injection system and of the disruption mitigation system. Then we need additional heating to heat up the plasma uh, more and the control system needs to control and monitor the three different heating systems, ion cyclotron heating, electron cyclotron heating and neutral beam injection. Again, here we have some pictures from factory and also a 3D model showing the injection, the heating system attached to the torus. And finally, we need diagnostics to measure the plasma parameters like current density and temperature and so on. In fact, there are more than 50 different diagnostics, which you can see on the map bottom right spread around the vacuum vessel. So the control system needs to control and monitor the diagnostics so they can provide the required measurement. But the control system also needs to treat the produced measurement uh, so it can be used for protection, plasma control, and scientific exploration. So I should say that uh, for ETO full performance, further systems are needed which are not included in this talk, in particular the tritium plant and the rad Rad, hard, rad waste facility. Okay, so now we have gone through all the systems we need to
to get the plasma and the control function of those. So why do we need an integrated control system? So this is a summary of the previous slides. So each vertical slide here represents one system. So they may work fine in isolation, but they don't work together. So there are interface problems, there are missing functionality in order to achieve integrated operation. So the role of the control system is to fix this. And we make the statement, which is, uh, let's say, the mission statement in one sentence. The ETO control system performs the functional integration of the ETO plant and enables integrated and automated operation. The key word here is integration. Before we go into details of the uh, integrated system functions, let's talk a little bit about the ETO control system architecture. So we use this say, simple picture to describe this. So the first feature is that we have three vertical tiers which are segregated. So the conventional one is the one used for operation. The interlock one is the one used for machine protection and the safety to ensure personnel and environmental safety. Then we have two horizontal layers. We have one central layer and many local layer, which we call plant system instrumentation and control. So if we combine this, it looks like this. So we have the uh, top part interfacing the lower part through computer networks. And also the scope of the top part is within ETO organization, while the bottom part is in, within the ETO domestic agencies through procurement arrangements. If we put some more details on this, we see each of these box represents some kind of computer, which can be a controller, a server, storage, or, or a workstation. So all these computers are uh, interconnected with computer networks, where we have uh, six different networks. And at the bottom, we have the sensors and actuators, and at the top, the human-machine interface. Now, in order to implement this architecture on the ETO site, physically, we need a network infrastructure. So we need to have connection points in every building where we can connect the system, and we need to connect all these buildings together. So this is the architecture of the network infrastructure, which is a configuration of a redundant dual star. So it means if you cut one cable, uh, it will still work. Uh, so one of these center points is uh, the control building, where all the green cables ends up. On top of this network infrastructure, we need a software infrastructure. So all participators on the network must talk the same protocol. So we use standard Ethernet, UDP, IP, and TCP IP protocol. On top of that, we have open source software, the most important being Experimental Physics and Industrial Control System, also called EPIX. Uh, this software provides all the standard control functions, such as human-machine interface, alarming, archiving, messaging, and so on. And also the backend data format is open source, hierarchical data format, five. I uh, should say here also that interlock and safety use different technologies for qualification and diversity reasons. Coming back to the control building, um, this is the home of the main control room and the main server room. Uh, as you can see top right, uh, the, almost all the area inside this building is used by those two. So this building construction is almost complete, as you can see. So you have the artist view to the right and the actual photo, recent photo of the building to the left. And the installation of networks and servers are starting now. So the main server room contains a lot of, um, uh, say, cabinets, cubicles, about 100, containing networks, servers, and storage. So it's really a data center. And uh, <coughs> here is the place where most of the software is ex executing, which is illustrated by this cool uh, retro terminal at the bottom right. So this is how we can vi vi visualize software. 
Then besides, we have the main control room. So this is, um, again, uh, artist views of the design here. So we have 80 seats, a nuclear safety desk, um, an occupational safety desk, and an interlock desk. So up to 80 people can, can use this. So this is very different from uh, where we started with this uh, box with three buttons. But one should remember here that most of these people don't control anything. So most people are just looking at data or monitoring system, and only very few have the uh, capability to control anything. So the, the goal here is um, to maximize automation in order to minimize human errors. A few <coughs> slides about defense in depth. So we're coming back to these three tiers. So as I said before, for operation, we only use the green box here. And only if we uh, run in over an operation limit or some serious fault appears, uh, the protection layer, the interlocks, kicks in to mitigate this error. And finally, uh, safety is the ultimate safeguard that we don't um, impose people or, or environment for any safety issues. So the arrows here they indicate integrity. So only the, uh, only the highest one can talk to the others. So it's a defense in depth scheme. And in the ideal world, when there is no arrows, uh, only the green layer will be used and the yellow and red will never be used. Um, <clears throat> few words about investment protection, so the interlock layer. So the main source of risks in order to destroy something of the machine is the superconducting magnets. So uh, if they quench, we have to dump a lot of energy somewhere. And of course, the hot plasma, which can cause damage in the vacuum vessel and the, the plasma facing components but also the plasma heating and fueling system, which can cause damage if the plasma density is not sufficient, and also the industrial system. So the, the role of the interlock control system is to detect and mitigate these risks. So for safety, it's segregated in two systems. The safety control system for occupational safety to protect personnel against non-nuclear hazards, for example, lack of oxygen, lasers, or high voltage. And the second system is for um, nuclear safety to protect personnel and the environment against nuclear hazards and the two risks with each is confinement and radiation. Similar here, the safety sy control system should detect these risks and mitigate them. So this is a table just to summarize some of the key parameters of the ITER control system. So we. <coughs> We will have at, uh, at the final configuration a few thousand of instrumentation and control cubicles or racks. We will have a few hundred thousand of plant INC signals. So these are wires from the INC cubicles to the actuators and sensors. <coughs> we will have a total number of a few millions of process variables. <coughs> so a process variable is um, can be an actuator and sensor, but it can also be a computed value, a calibration factor, a limit, or something like that. So if you look on these numbers, they are very, very big. Maybe there is no other control system in the world with such big numbers. On the other hand, if we look at the bottom of the table, the performance parameters, these are not um, so challenging because they can be obtained using off-the-shelf equipment. If we compare this to uh, other, other plants, like a nuclear power plant, we can say that this is much bigger and much more complex than a nuclear power plant. If we compare it to a CERN Large Hadron Collider, maybe the size is similar, but uh, the, the, the performance requirements for CERN is much more stringent. On the other hand, for ITER, the coupling between the instruments or diagnostics and the machine is much tighter than for CERN or any accelerator. Okay, now we go on coming into the integrated control system functions. The first one is monitoring. So we need to monitor 
and combine data from multiple systems to synthesize them to say more abstract data which is easy to interpret by the operator. We need alarming and notification if something goes wrong. We need trending to understand what is going on. And we need electronic logbook to communicate between operators of different systems as well as different shift. So here are just three examples of, um, of this. So the left one is a smartphone showing in real time all the voltages on the platform. Second one is an alarm notification received as an email or SMS. And to the right, we have a summary status of all the systems making up ETER. Then we need coordination. So all systems need to be operated in integrated fashion. So we have defined um, um, synth synthetic states, which all system has to obey to. Uh, and the composite of all states from all the required system allows the operator to know the ETO state at a glance. And it can also be used to permit or prohibit uh, the next action. We have a lot of configuration, so we had to manage all these persistent configuration parameters. So they had to survive system reboots, system reinstallation, both hard hardware and software. But we also need to manage all the parameters required to perform an experiment. So the control system must provide interface to the scientist to specify the experiment information, to derive machine par parameter from that. Con to conduct engineering verification and to load those parameters in the plant system. Then we need to synchronize things. All systems need to be synchronized to work on the right time in order for distributed feedback control loops to work and in order to be able to correlate data from different systems post-mortem. So the ETO timing system distributes absolute time to all systems with an accuracy of uh, sub-microsecond and to the right, there is some data which confirms this performance. We need to sequence things. So for example, we need to uh, operate, perform an operation task like cool down, baking, glow discharge cleaning, plasma pulse, which needs to sequence different systems in a certain order. So to the right, we have an example of starting um, wall conditioning with baking, and to the left, execution of a plasma pulse. Then we need uh, access control to ensure control actions can only be carried out by authorized operators. So the operator log in using a personal account and the operator belongs to a group. And then control action is only allowed if three conditions are fulfilled. So the group is authorized to co control this device. The control action is executed from an authorized terminal and the ETO plant is in a state allowing this control action. Of course, in a control system, you have feedback control everywhere, locally and distributed. And it's all the same principle, which is uh, shown uh, to the right, simple control theory. So you have a, a demand, you want to achieve something. You have a sensor to measure the actual status. This generates uh, an error, which is fed into a controller, which executes a control law, which outputs a demand to the system or actor which is measured by the sensor. And then you go around this loop with a frequency depending on the dynamics of the system. And if everything is fine, you get the response as, as you see below. So the control system needs sensors, act actuators, and controllers. And it needs sampling rates, which are 10 times larger than the control bandwidth. So the ultimate feedback control is the plasma control. So this is to control the plasma, current, shape, density, and so on, where the sensors are diagnostics and the actuators, the coil power supply, fueling, and heating. So this is a very complex system, so-called multiple in, multiple out system, where you combine data and, and uh, split data. And it's a big topic, so there is a dedicated ETO talk on this topic. The point here is just to say that the plasma control is implemented as a part of the integrated control system. Of course, ITO does not deliver energy, but data. So data is the most uh, valuable uh, output from ITO. So we need to be sure that we uh, acquire and safely archive all data produced. 
and we need to provide access to this data in order to understand what is happening and to scientifically explore ITER. So this show here just some examples of tools to visualize the data. In addition to the standard um, uh, human-machine interface uh, seen before, we need dedicated tool for real-time visualization. So here we have two examples. The first one is um, uh, infrared camera looking into the vacuum vessel, so it's part of a diagnostic, where we can see the interaction uh, with the uh, plasma with the, with the walls. Uh, the right one is a reconstruction of the plasma uh, size and shape, so the, the bluish bump in the middle. So this is a cro cross section of the vacuum vessel. And then we have animation of the currents in the different coils, so the six central solenoid units and the six poloidal field coils auto and then some trends to add to this. So we can summarize the pulse operation data flow using what we have said before. So the starting point is the scientist who wants to perform an experiment. So he specifies this using the scheduler. And this is validated if it's possible or not. And when everything is okay, this is transferred to the scheduled storage. This is all done offline well in advance. When it's going to be executed, the shift operation manager picks the next schedule from the queue and loads it into the supervisor. The supervisor performs addi additional checks, including the current state of the ITER plant. When everything is okay, the countdown is started. Then the parameters, all the parameters are downloaded to all the plant systems uh, and they are prepared for a plasma pulse. When countdown reaches zero, the control is given to the plasma control system, which then executes the pulse by sending demands to all the plant system. And throughout this, data is streaming out from the executing box into the storage and the scientist can uh, access the data to understand what is happening and to improve the next experiment. And actually, the scientist uh, can be in the main control room, but he can also be remote in a remote participation center um, dedicated for this. This is the same information for the countdown. So at the bottom, you see the time. So there are two time scales. One is operational time and one is the pulse time. You see the authorization by the operator to proceed with this execution. Uh, above that, you see the main active software packages, so the supervisor, the data acquisition and archiving, and the plasma control. You can see handover of the control from supervisor to PCS and hand back. And on top of that, you see one of the, <coughs> some of the machine real-time parameters, like the plasma current, central solenoid coils, etc. Where are we? On this last part of the operational software, application software, uh, this is still in development and prototyping phase, so there is a lot of work uh, still remaining. It's being um, injected in production in pieces, but also uh, de deployed on existing tokamaks, particular K-Star, in order to validate we are on the right path. But this work is uh, <coughs> accelerating now. But we have other metrics for the integration. So this one is a metrics for the um, hardware. So we have um, this uh, uh, instrumentation and control cubicles. You see some example to the left on the picture, which we need to energize. Uh, in order to energize this cubicle, of course, they need to be installed. All the cables need to be connected, both to the field, all the actuators and sensors, but also to the central infrastructure. And um, then we had to pass the legal uh, electrical ins uh, inspection. So we know from engineering data that we will have at first plasma about 1,500 of these cubicle, which needs to be energized. We know when we need to energize this based on the system commissioning schedule. So we cannot perform system commissioning without energized cubicles. And then we can draw this blue graph here. And today we are about a bit more than 200 energized cubicles. So this metric gives 13% of first plasma integration scope complete. 
Another metric more related to software is the integration of process variables. So we, we can easily extract this from the software repository. We can estimate based on design data and complexity that we will have about 3,700,000 process variables integrated at first plasma. And same as before, we know when we need to integrate which process variable based on the commissioning schedule. So in this case, we, today we have something like 700,000 process variables in production, which corresponds to 20% of first plasma integration scope complete. So time to wrap up. The first conclusion is that we have not forgotten the E to start button. Second conclusion is that the E to brain is software, software and software. Then ETO control system performs the functional integration of ETO plant and enables integrated and automated operation. Uh, and today the ETO control system is in design, manufacturing, integration, commissioning and operation in parallel. So all the life phases. Today integration of the local plant control system is 15% complete towards first plasma and the work to design and develop high-level operation applications software is accelerating. And before concluding, I just want to put some faces on the people behind this work. Thank you. <laughs>